水困。Mm -hmm. uh, okay, it is started. So to for to those who have just joined the lecture, my name is Mr. Mpati. And I, as I always say, I must commend you for choosing to, you know, pursue, for choosing Atlant resources to help you in your pursuit for a CCA journey. And clearly, this is a very more, it's, it's a very dis, important decision that we are humbled. And we, um, my prayers is that let this not be a shot in the dark. May you be rewarded. I, I just pray that God will actually be pleased as you consummate this particular subject come June examinations. And in July we'll be all smiling. Uh, this is an ongoing thing, of course. AFM is a very easy subject. AFM is a very easy subject. It's, 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 it's the subject that I would recommend people to choose or students to choose, especially if you've got strict uh, uh, or limited time because of work pressures and a lot of other things. I would recommend you to choose AFM. I, by uh, myself, you know, I am a financial expert. My, that's that's my profession. I'm a chartered financial analyst. So when it comes to finance, it's, it's just oozes in my blood. I so when I'm when I'm getting you guys joining the fold, I feel humbled. I feel humbled, and I will try my level best to assist you doing achieving the same. Okay, allow me to share my screen. Uh, Allow me to share my screen. So for, for those who have joined us today, we discussed the, the introductory remarks last week. Let me share that. Allow me to share that um, to your Skype inboxes. Let me send that to your Skype inboxes, what we discussed last week. I have uh, patience. I have princess I did send to you. Uh, so I have patience and melody. Allow me to do that just now. Melody and print and, and patience. Please know that this is available for just 30 days. So it, it wasn't a lecture per se. It was just introductory lectures. So this is introductory lectures. Introductory. Introductory session last week. Thereafter, I will be trying to make sure I, I organize, I, I get these uploaded and send them to you. So Melody, if you can check in your Skype inboxes, you see that I have sent this okay. last week's introductory lecture. So it was introductory lectures, but please not it's it's not like it's not important still important because these are the first topics and you do notice if you play that particular video there are past exam questions on that topic i must commend you my wonderful team uh, for your attendance you can see we have got 100 percent attendance this shows that we are indeed dealing with chartered accountants we you we can't no wonder why i had to delay this to six because I know some of you are traveling from weekend. I want 100% attendance. Okay, uh, last week, last week, this is AFM topics. AFM June, uh, June 2022, topic listing. Topic listing, you know? So, so perfect. Uh, in On the platform, we do have quite a lot of other things. We do have a lot of other things on the platform, uh, on the learning platform. I'm sure our admin team has, has already done a lot of things concerning that, a lot of uh, sessions with you. But let me say, these are the topics we are going to do with the tutor. So the first one here is discounted cash flow techniques. 
discounted cash flow techniques. The second one is option, option pricing. Third one, you know, this is in order of importance. After doing option pricing, I want us to do cost of capital. Cost of capital. Cost of capital, comma, sources of finance. Sources of finance, comma. Bonds, bonds, comma, capital. It's, it's a single topic, capital structure, capital structure and a PV. I will be, I will be, I will be showing you by a PV, we mean adjusted present values. Adjusted present values. That's what we mean by a PV. I'll be, I'll be taking through you through the system to show you where we get these particular topics in the system itself. Then number four, we do appraising foreign projects. Raising foreign projects. Then number five, measures and acquisitions. Measures and acquisitions. Then number six, do corporate reconstruction. Corporate reconstruction. Uh, it, some call it financial organization or reconstructions to find. Seven, we do risk management. Risk uh, management. Management. By risk management, we are saying aging currency and interest interest rates. A risk. That's what we are referring to there. So after I have done this, you can agree with your tutor that AFM is a very, very short syllabus. It has got only seven topics, which are of paramount importance. Though if you go to the platform here, you know, the platform that our mem our admin team have taken you through. This is the primary mechanism of us delivering AFM courses in a digital world. Don't underestimate this because that's where we have populated the notes. That's where we have done quite a lot, quite a lot. You know, this particular platform is a product of, it's a consummation of the partnership we had with First Intuition. And I'm happy I'm seeing that quite a lot of you guys are registering on the platform, which is pretty cool. And this week we expect quite a, more, quite a lot from you also to get registered. I'm seeing some of you are yet to be added on the platform. Please uh, check your emails and get a uh, login credentials. If you haven't received those, check with our administration team tomorrow i it's an admin issue i can't be i'm not in a position to register you okay so i have listed the topics and i'm sure you were also listing them down notice there are just seven topics they are just seven topics but here on the platform these topics are delineated into sessions and we do have how many sessions? 23, not even 23, yes, 23 sessions. But these 23 sessions, as I am teaching you, I'm going to compress them into just seven topics. This shows you the reason, what, this, this is the reason why you have been enrolled with Atlantic Resources. We are good at jump-starting things and jump starting those things in a manner which is effective, in a manner which just hits the mark. Um, so here you are, and as I said last week, please don't open the mocks. Don't open mock exams so far. 
reason why I don't want you to open mock exams is the moment you open the mock exams, your account will credit as if you have attempted the mock. These mocks are timed and they mimic your actual exam. So don't open the mock until we are done with the syllabus. Because if you open the mock exams now, and by the time you want to do the syllabus, you will not be in a position to open them because the marking scheme is populated whenever you open the mock. So if you open the mock for interest sake, by the time you now want to, eat, to actually do the mock, you have already activated the marking scheme and it won't open for you because it will say it's no longer the mock is the marking scheme is now active. Then you'll be, you, you now have to, to ask our administration to populate another mock and you'll be asked to pay additional fee. No wonder why on these particular mocks, there are instructions here where we tell you that you need to have three hours, 15 minutes before you hit the take now button. So this requires that this is timed. Don't open the mock for fun and close it 10 minutes later because your account will say you have attained 0% on that mock and the marking scheme is populated. It defeats the whole purpose of it being a mock. I mentioned this in the previous lecture, so I continue to mention it. So all these topics in, on this particular platform, they may appear like 22 topics. You now understand that at Atlas Resources, we just compress them to seven topics. Now, for those who have joined us today, last week I asked everyone to do session one to session seven. And the procedure is you don't just play the videos here. You come to study materials first. If you want to study materials on, on, on session four, you first read the course notes on session four, which is management of international trade and investment. After you are done with course notes, you then come to session four. Once you are on session four, you play lecture videos that we have populated. And then you will see that there is, issue, there is a question bank here. Before you go to session five, Go in the question bank at, and attempt questions from the question bank on session four. For more details, please play the video I have sent to your individual Skype inboxes for those who have joined us today. So what is it that we are then supposed to be doing today, say, if you may ask? Now that last week I said do chapter one, session one to say, why is it I said session one to seven? This is merely a recap of knowledge that you already know. It's largely theoretical. In other words, you can understand it on the go. It does not necessarily mean that it's not important. It's quite important. But it doesn't require tutor, you know. This is not value for money. It's something that you can understand. I can just let you do it because you can understand it. So where, where is it that we want to cover? Today we want to cover session eight, advanced investment appraisal. So hang in there guys, as we now go to the salient aspects of the topic. Uh, it's, it's written here, advanced investment appraisal, but it's actually discounted cash flow techniques on our topic listing. So if you can allow me to, to list it again, discounted cash flow techniques you know, this, 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 and this, this is also based on knowledge brought forward. You know, by now you are ex expected to know what NPV is. You're expected to know quite a lot of other stuff. But if you don't, never mind. That's why you have chosen your tutor and I'm here to teach you as if nothing has happened. There are various concepts that I'm going to cover on discounted cash flow techniques, but chief among them are A, Determination of project cash flows. Determination of project cash flows. Determination of project cash flows. Right? Remember, I'm typing. 
we don't give you notes. You already de you have them under course notes. But if you can still want to type as I'm saying it here, you can. But remember, the video is being recorded. So you have the video with yourself. Now, even if I'm recording what I'm typing here, make sure that our primary vehicle of delivering lectures is here on the platform. You have course notes already and class lecture videos like on investment, advanced investment appraisal. You have how many videos that we have populated here? Four. So make sure, make sure you have these. This is our primary model of delivering lectures. So when you are playing this, know that this is complementing to the platform video because we don't have notes on this platform, but rather I am just taking you through what is on the platform. Determination of project cash flow. So the question is, the issue is relevant cash flows, relevant cash flows um, for a potential project, for a potential project are determined as follows. Now, notice Peshi, say is saying relevant cash flows. I'm not saying cash flows. Meaning there are cash flows which are not relevant. Those ones are, 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 not, are not included when we are undertaking investment appraisal. So there's a great deal of neatness here. Yeah. yeah. One. Let, let us just let us say we are dealing with a project with a two-year life. This there is need for observing money monetary values. This project is a three-year life. Three-year life. Um, you observe monetary values like this. And notice, you can see that your say is neat. Right away, you have to see it. Because there's a great deal of neatness there. So don't say, say, teach us Excel. You can see I'm not writing on paper. I'm actually doing it on Excel. Your exam is computer based. So I'm killing two beds with one stone. You say incremental sales. Incremental sales. This is your inflows. Then you say savings in costs. Savings in costs. You know, there are projects which can bring savings in costs. Don't always say incomes are in the form of sales. No. Uh, then incremental costs. Incremental costs. Uh, if I can do it this way. All right. It's not like all projects bring in incomes in the form of revenue. Some bring income in the form of savings in costs. Please know that. Then we have got tax allowable depreciation. Tax allowable depreciation. This is when you are told that in the exam it's, it's, it's there. When you are told it there in the exam that the, the firm can claim tax allowable depreciation. Once you have done this, you know, when we are saying on the line, we are saying incremental costs, make sure you list them one by one. This line here, you list one by one. If they are variable costs, if there's what, if there's what, if there's what, list those one by one. Then you have got taxable income. Taxable income. Then we have tax at Y percent. Tax at Y percent. Right. Tax at Y percent. Right. You can see that tax is negative because, as, as you can know, tax is it's an outflow. After you have added text, you say add back, add back uh, tax benefit on capital allowances, tax allowable depreciation. Why are you adding back tax allowable depreciation? It's because it's a non cash item. You deducted it here for the purpose of calculating tax. 
And now that we have calculated takes, you have to add it back. The reason being it's a non cash item. Remember, we are, we are preparing a determination of project cash flows. Then we have got incremental working capital. Incremental working capital. So, you know, working capital can, it can be positive or negative. No wonder why we, 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 we have incremental working capital like this. All right. And then normally in the final year, it's positive if it is going to be recovered. And then we have got a residual value of the asset. Residual value here. This is normally positive. And then we have got ETC, allow the examiner to put as much stuff as the examiner feels appropriate. Uh, we do have that. And then we have got net annual cash flows. Net annual cash flows. Cash flows. Don't worry. You are already in the thick of things with your say. All you have to do is to enjoy the net annual cash flows. You can see here there's no year zero because I'm saying annual year zero. These year zero cash flows are at the beginning. So we we we, we have deliberately ignored them there. Now let us have points to note. Points to note. So so important. These are important points to note, actually. That's the proper term. Points to note. Yang in there, you are now being told points to note by yourself. If tax is paid one year, one year in areas, then the project is life extended by a year. What, what do I mean by that? If you are paying tax one year in areas, know for sure that the project's life is extended by a year because you need the year to lapse and then you pay tax in the following year. So you, under the circumstances, the project's life will be uh, extended by a year. We have these guys, so, so important. B irrelevant cash flows are ignored irrelevant cash flows are ignored and you know we do have quite a lot of irrelevant cash flows e.g sunk costs sunk costs like research costs research costs um, as well as is non cash items non cash items such as depreciation non cash items like depreciation we don't include them but capital allowances which we refer to as tax allowable depreciation this we can include but notice we then add them back there after calculating tax Incremental working capital. What do we mean by that? Working capital. What do we mean by incremental working? Oh, look at my spelling for working capital. It appears I'm screwing it throughout. Uh, incre incremental working capital. The level of investment, working capital, working capital is adjusted during the project is life normally that's 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 the procedure as we are undertaking the project we need working capital like receivables payables inventory etc and this the level of the amount we invest in this working capital varies with the scope of the project you know that the relevant cash flow, the relevant cash flow is the amount required 
to increase or decrease working capital to a desired level. You know, let me take your mind, uh, your, 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 let me refresh your memory. You remember when you are doing statements of cash flows, you were told that if data increase, let's say receivables, or let's say inventory, if it increases from, it increases from 60 to 90. If you are told what is the cash flow, you wouldn't say it's 90. You say it's 30 cash outflow. That is the cash flow implication of adjusting your working capital. So when you are now saying working capital, we are not saying inventory. We are simply saying inventory, receivables, uh, uh, payables taken together, that's working capital. If it increases, it's a cash outflow. If it decreases, it's a cash inflow. So we can we can now have say yeah. So you do this as a separate working. Yes, yeah, zero, oh, one, two, three, four. Let's let me say up to four. But normally, you know, if you are running a project, for example. If you are running a project, when it's now in the final year, suppose you have a boutique and the boutique is now in its final year, you don't just close the boutique and go away. You say, oh, I'm done with the boutique and I'm, I, I want to close it and go away. That's not how we do it, team. You know that? If you still have some clothes in the boutique, you have to sell them to wrap up your closing inventory levels. So when you are now selling clothes in your boutique at the end of your boutique project, we say you are now recovering your working capital. It's called the recovery or release of working capital. So let me write that point here. The investment in working capital at the end of the project usually recovered or released when the project is completed. When the project is completed, you have to assume this unless stated otherwise, unless otherwise indicated. unless the examiner is, is said something to the contrary. So this is your working capital working. This is your working capital working. What you have to do is you say, you say working capital level be given by the examiner how you calculate working capital level. But the most important thing there is working capital is required at the beginning. In other words, you don't sell clothes and then order them. You first order clothes and then sell them. No wonder why we need working capital at the, be at the beginning. So if it's 500 at the beginning and it goes to 790 and it falls down to 544 and then it, it's, it's now 580. Notice it is always required at the beginning. No wonder why I have put here zero there. So this is working capital level. Now, if you need cash flow, Incremental cash flow on working capital. Incremental cash flow. It's like in the first year you had zero working capital, so you want to invest 500. So in the first year you fork out 500 at the beginning. But thereafter you just take the increase or decrease. So it will be equal to 500 minus this. You get that? So you, if you need to increase it by 290, so this is the cash flow. If it falls from 790 to 544, this is the cash inflow. If it increases to this, this is cash outflow of 36. Now in the final year, normally you have to recover or release your working capital. So if you have to recover your working capital, we are saying get all the money. So it has to be at zero. 
So in the final year, you will cover it like this. So the investment you had, 580, you will cover it. Why is 580 in year three, but it covered in year four? Because it is paid at the beginning. And you know, when you are saying beginning of year four, it's called year three. Right. C, D, just going through the most important points there. Not a relevant cash flow. A relevant cash flow. Cash flow as it is implied in the company's cost of capital. You know, when you are calculate, when you are determining project cash flows, please take it from your say don't include interest the reason is interest is the one that you use to discount a cash flow so if you discount a cash flow you are actually incorporating interest for example let's say we have got year six year six and cash flow here is or is 800 and then discounting factor is 0 0.5503. So you do have what is called present value. It's 800 multiplied by 0 0.503. So what it means is this 402 here is, the, is today's value of this 800 in year 6. So if you are getting present value, Please pay attention. If you are getting present value, you are actually deducting interest. That's what you are doing. It's 800 in year six, but today's value is 50402. So what we have done is you have deducted the interest. So if you had included interest amongst the, if you have included interest amongst the cash flows, and then proceed to discount those cash flows. It means interest, you are deducting it twice. No wonder why interest is an irrelevant cash flow. That's what we are referring to here. E. Annual cash flows. Cash flows can be adjusted for risk and uncertainty and certain oh before i come to risk and uncertainty let me put it on f let's say annual cash flows annual cash flows can be real or nominal annual cash flows can be real or nominal what are, what, what are real cash flows and what are nominal cash flows? So let me have real cash flows. Real cash flows, which I can shorten as RCF. What are real cash flows? So these are cash flows, cash flows which which are which are not inflated they are known as current price current price cash flows so real cash flows are cash flows which are not inflated please take that and then they are discounted They are discounted using real discount rate. Meaning a discount rate which doesn't take into account inflation. It which doesn't take. Right. 
that's that's annual that's real cash flows if you know that your cash flows are not inflated or they are expressed in current price terms make sure that you don't in you 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 also discount them using the real discount rate then we do have what is called nominal or money cash flows oh let me, let me okay let me uh, I'll, I'll come to I'll come to that later, but let me proceed. These are cash flows which have been inflated. These are cash flows which have been inflated. That's nominal cash flows, cash flows which are inflated. Well, some call them money cash flows. They are discounted. They are discounted using money or nominal cost of capital. They are discounted using money or nominal cost of capital. You get it? OK. Uh, so I, I'm sure I have my question bank open here. I just want to see if I can, you know, there are instances where I have to show you this, but if, if I can have the questions, if I can, if I can have the questions here in the question bank. It's a very, you know, question bank cannot be printed. These are view only documents for security features, for security reasons. They are only few, only doc, docs. Because my data is kind of suppressed, perhaps I may not be in a position to open the question bank. Oh, yes, it has managed to open. So you can see these are few, only documents. Okay. You know, being the first being the first lecture, you might not necessarily get a question which addresses that that lecture, that particular lecture only. So let me quickly get it some. Allow me to quickly get it elsewhere. Well, I'll get to the question. Let me proceed. Let me proceed until I have taught you quite a lot so that we can open a question. So what is it that I was saying? I was saying nominal cash flows. These are cash flows which are inflated and they are discounted using nominal cost of capital. Now, how do you come up to a nominal cash flow? So you can say inflated. Inflate. Let me open any question paper because I still want to show you something. Let me open any question paper here. You know, these are the revision package. This is the revision package for your team, which wrote exams in March. So everyone who wrote exams went through this particular revision package. So, so important. We do have packages that we create, and for you, we are going to create again. So, uh, I can pass 
there's a paper I want to open which will actually save us as we do something else. You know, all papers are obtainable from a uh, from a CCA Global website. So you all you have to do is to come to the past exam library, past exam library on that particular subject, and then in the past exam library you have got question paper bonanza. This is question paper bonanza. You can get as many papers as possible. Uh, Okay, allow me to open this paper and also to send it via, allow me also to send it via, via Skype chat. Let me send it. A lot of things are popping up and you wonder what, what are these. So I've just downloaded a question paper. I send it to you. You can check this question paper in the chat button in our WhatsApp class, in our Skype class, sorry, not WhatsApp. Look up for it. I'm proceeding with, with the notes. So I wanted to, to say inflation adjusted cash flow. Inflation adjusted cash flow equals, if you want to adjust the cash flow for inflation, you say a real cash flow, meaning cash flow without inflation times one plus h to the power one plus h to the power you know when you are punching to the power on your desktop it's on your on your keypad it's shift six power n where where h is the h equals a rate of inflation a rate of inflation and n equals the year in which in which the cash flow occurs in which the cash flow occurs that's your that's your h there that's that's your n there so if it's in year six you put six if it's in year five you put five simple as that. Now, you may say, say, you are you are taking us through, and these are the things that we have heard in the past, but we might have forgotten. So thank you so much, you are taking us through. But tell me something. You are saying nominal cash flows are discounted using nominal cost of capital. What if I'm not given the nominal cost of capital? So if you are not given the nominal cost of capital, this is how you find it. The relationship relationship between between the money and a real cost of capital is given by the Fisher equation Fisher equation is follow so you do have the Fisher equation the Fisher equation helps you to, to get the real cost of capital if you are not given it, or the nominal cost of capital should you, your cash flows be inflated. So this is how the Fisher equation looks like. In the question paper, you'll be given the Fisher equation. So this is a paper a paper based version of your paper of your question paper, but it was written on a CBE format. So you, you'll be given a table of formula like this one, where you're given the Fisher formula. Yeah, this is the Fisher formula. The Fisher formula. So what, what does the Fisher formula tell us? It tells us how you can get a real discount rate if you are given nominal and vice versa. 
So it's like the feature formula, it's like one plus I close brackets equals one plus R bracket one plus H. These are in decimals where A, A, uh, I is the nominal rate, nominal interest rate, and then R is the real interest or the real discount rate, discount rate, and H general inflation rate. General inflation rate. You can actually use this relationship to 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 find the nominal if if you feel like your cash flows have been inflated. Make sure that these all these are percentages. These rates are percentages. When you are when you are when you are typing, the rates are in decimals. It's rates in decimals. So important, make sure the rates are in decimals in this formula. So if it's 20%, it's 0 0,2. If it's 5%, it's 0 0,05. This is so important. Don't forget that. When was that? What, what is it that we were doing? We are, do, we are doing the main point to note when you are determining project cash flows. Because if you see project cash flows like this, where you end max is your ability to understand everything that we are saying here under important points to note. And these are your sources of easy max. So I was on H. Today I want, I'm not going to take it to take long, but I'm now going to the last point. We were on E and now on F. This is going to be our last discussion item, F. Annual cash flows can be uh, can be adjusted can be adjusted for risk and uncertainty using any of the following techniques To bring you up to speed, please make sure I am explaining what is given in the platform, in this learning platform here. This is the primary model for lecture delivery, but there are instances when if I don't explain it, you may have challenges. So before I cause you to read the notes on, on session eight, we are already on session eight. We did session one to seven last week. If we haven't, it's so easy. It's merely theoretical, so you can understand it. It's theory heavy, but where you need the tutor is from session eight going forward. So already, uh, this is you can see that's what we are doing today is where you need the tutor. So it's still fine. But before you use, you go to the course notes on the platform and stuff. I always give you these notes first. You now understand. In, in, in as much as you are now going on the platform, everything here makes sense. When you now you have the course notes and everything, it makes sense. So this no, this this deep, this is like deep briefing sessions of the platform. We we can upload them on YouTube, and you can play them at will. But the primary method of our course delivery is this. So these notes are supplementing this. Please, I always repeat on that. When you are using the platform, come to the study material section go to the course notes on the topic you want to do on the session you want to do after you've done that session you then come to the session so if it was session eight after you have read the notes you then have to come like to these class lecture videos so you have this you get that so it's so important so important I always repeat this because it's so 
I feel like I have to repeat it over and over until it sinks. So we, where are we? Uh, annual cash flows can be adjusted for risk and uncertainty using any of the following techniques. Uh, so I have to mention this because I know some of some who play this video on YouTube and think that it's enough. They have to enroll with Atlas resources for for them to get the better package. Though this one can 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 provoke that interest and the agency for them to register. OK, uh, there are various ways you can adjust for risk and uncertainty. You know, you can use. One, let me list them first. Expected value approach. Approach, you know. You can adjust for risk and uncertainty using expected value approach. Adjust for risk and uncertainty using. Uh, oh, let me let me just list and explain at the same time. When you are using expected value, remember it's like probability times cash flow. So it's like this approach uses probabilities, probabilities, probabilities to determine the expected cash flow. When you are using this approach, you are using probabilities to determine expected cash flow. You know, so it's like expected cash flow equals. Expected cash flow equals sum of. Probability. Times cash flow. It's so easy. This approach is easy and it's similar to. It's actually based on the concept that you, 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 you know and you can relate. Like if you are given that, suppose you are taking off, we are want to invest in China, but we don't know how, what variable costs are going to be. So we know that variable costs can be 15, can be 20, or can be 30. We, we, we don't know the, the exact figure of variable cost, but these are, this is the probability. Probability. It can be 40%, 30%, 30%. Now, so you then have to say P times cash flow, probability times cash flow, you say variable cost multiplied by its relevant probability. And then if you if you tally these up. you then get expected variable cost. Expected variable cost. So when you are now evaluating the project, the variable cost you are going to use is 21. You are not going to use any of these. You are now going to use 21. This is the variable cost that you are going to use for investment appraisal. So the problem with the expected value approach is that the probabilities are subjective. They may not be based on empirical research. In other words, they may not be random. They may not give you the actual picture. Then, then another way of taking into account risk and uncertainty when you are evaluating project cash flows is using adjusted costs of capital use the risk adjusted cost of capital. Some call it risk adjusted cost of capital or others call it project specific. Project specific. Cost of capital. This is another way of taking into account. Um, this is another way of taking into account a uh, risk and uncertainty. So what is project specific cost of capital? It's like you are doing a haulage business and you want to venture into boutique business. Currently you are into haulage. You want to venture into boutique. Honestly, you can't use 
how large the cost of capital as a discount rate for the boutique business because these have got different risk and return characteristics. So what you then have to do is you use boutique specific cost of capital. So what is project specific cost of capital? This is the discount rate which takes into account a unique unique risks associated with the project. That project is specific cost of capital. It's, it's one way of incorporating risk and uncertainty in the project. Then another is simulation. simulation. There are various simulation models that we can use Let's say EG Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation. Now, simulation, uh, it's, 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 let me define it in, a, in simpler terms. This uses a computer software, a computer software. It's in simpler terms to perform random combinations of project cash flows to perform random combinations combinations of project cash flows project cash flows cash flows in order in order to obtain a probability distribution, a probability distribution, probability distribution of say project is NPV. Simulation. When you are simulation, uh, when, when 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 you are when you are carrying out simulation, you are you are it's a it's a, it's a, it's a systematic procedure actually. It's a systematic procedure of using a computer software to perform random combinations of the project cash flows in order to obtain a probability distribution of the uh, project is NPV. Let me explain it. You notice the on, let's say in Olympics, we, we, we recently had Olympics. So if there's an Olympic sport, like people, athletes are walking on a rope, Suppose it's an Olympic sport where athletes are walking on a rope. On a rope. Do you know that the athlete doesn't walk just once and get an award? No. The the, the athlete walks say ten times on that rope. On that rope. So why is it the athlete is walking ten times? If we can see that on the first attempt, the athlete was able to walk. The reason why we have to let the athlete walk 10 times is because we want to boost confidence of the judges that the athlete can walk on that rope, on that rope. And that repeated procedure of walking on the rope is called simulation. So if you walk on the rope 10 times and you fall once, it means as judges, we are now 90% sure that you can walk on that rope. So if you want to invest in China, for example, don't just have a single combination of project cash flows. Otherwise, your confidence is dampened. Rather, repeat various combinations of cash flows. And on each combination, calculate NPV, calculate NPV, calculate NPV, and then determine the probability of positive NPVs. In so doing, your confidence is boosted. Here is how it goes. You know, there are various softwares we can use to, to perform simulation procedures. The most common one is like pivot tables on Excel, random digits on Excel. Microsoft Excel can do that. We want to undertake a project in China. So we can say selling price is from 27 to 38. Variable costs is from 11 to 17 
with this command only, we can say that we can then say simulate this single command. We can say let us simulate the cache flow. You know what will happen? The computer software with this command can come up with 1 billion NPVs at each combination of cache flows. It can give you 1 billion NPVs with that command. Let's say the computer software came up with 1 million NPVs and of the 1 million, 850,000 of these are positive. So as decision makers, we can now say we are 85% sure that if we invest in China, we are going to have positive NPVs. And why our confidence is now in the 85% category is because of simulation. You, I, I'm just putting it in a manner you understand it, Tim. I know they are very... So in an exam, we don't expect you to simulate because it's a computer software that is in use. But rather, we expect you to explain what simulation is. Then there is sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis. Now, what is sensitivity analysis, if you may ask? A sensitivity analysis, what we are saying when we are carrying out sensitivity analysis, what we are simply doing here is um, we are investigating, you know, it's not. It's not good to tell directors that, look, the project is going to have a positive NPV, so let us accept it. That positive NPV that we have just obtained from what I have just said, it's a result of a single combination of cash flows. It's a result of a single combination of cash flows. And also know that in reality, NPV means the project is to start today, but in reality, we don't start a project today. We may still need to build factories, to build roads. And whilst we are doing that, variable costs can change, selling price can change, competitors may enter in, competitors may leave. So we want you to escalate it a little bit. Instead of telling us that the project is positive NPV, so that therefore it must be accepted. We, we need you to undertake sensitivity analysis. Now you can say, what does that say? Sensitivity analysis is a step further of informing us as directors to say, look, in as much as the project has got a positive NPV, if variable costs change by 7%, the NPV becomes negative or it becomes zero. So don't do the project. If initial outlay change by so much, the NPV becomes zero. In so doing, you are doing it proper to directors because we now know that we should not just rely on a positive NPV now. We also need to take into account if circumstances and events change and the threshold uh, or the magnitude within which they have to change for us to take another trajectory or another course of action. That is called sensitivity analysis. So this approach evaluates this approach evaluates the effect of a change. Oh, before 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 I proceed, are you not seeing team that when I am teaching AFM, I just say it like stories. This, this confirms what I said at the beginning. It's easy. AFM, it's easy. I don't know if when I, I just say, in as much as I'm, teach, I'm teaching it, I'm not even thinking. I'm just saying it like this. Be inspired by your tutor. You can see I'm not reading anyway. I'm just saying it. So be inspired by your tutor. When you are asked, is AFM an easy thing, a, a difficult thing, a difficult subject? A, you need not to, to, to even consider whatever you might know. Just say, as far as my tutor is concerned, that thing is very it's pretty, it's, it's pretty easy. I don't know where it was all the way all the time. Uh, so this approach evaluates the effect of a change in a project variable. The effect of a change in project variable 
such as such as you know various things can change let's say selling price sales volume initial cost initial cost variable costs etc on the project is npv on the project is npv that's 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 sensitivity analysis you are investigating how if if these things change how is it going to affect the project is npv so we may say we may now say project is sensitivity to project is sensitivity sensitivity to uh, let me say project is sensitivity to suppose you want to know how, how sensitive the project is to initial cost the method of saying equals npv over initial cost initial cost you multiply that by 100 percent so you say eg eg if this comes out as five percent what it means is if this comes out as five percent the comment would read initial cost initial cost can increase by five percent for the project is NPV to be zero. To be zero. Simple. That's that project is sensitivity to initial cost. So if you are working project is sensitivity to variable cost. Variable cost, it's a matter of saying project is sensitivity to variable cost it's a matter of saying uh, uh, you say oh sorry let 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 me not bold it otherwise it's, it's, it's coming out wrong say NPV over variable over present value of PV of VC that's present value of variable cost and then you multiply that thing by 100%. So, uh, so EG, 10%. So what it means is, if you work it out and it comes out like this, if, it, if you work it out and it comes out like this, it means VC can increase by 10% for the project is, VC can increase by 10% for the project is NPV to be zero. That's what it means. And then you can continue to carry out this sensitivity analysis. You can say selling price. Selling price or sales volume. Simply say NPV over PV of contribution, PV of contribution multiplied by 100%. I told you that when I'm teaching you, I don't assume you know things. I teach you like tabula rasa. Oh, yes, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. notice. Says is spoken a very, very large word. Isn't it so? Lindy way, I teach you tabula rasa. Have you ever heard that? Hmm? Princess, uh, uh, we need to sort out this word here. I teach you tabula rasa. Have you ever heard of that? Well, oh yes, yes, you have to figure it out later. Tabula rasa means I consider you like a table which I then have to fill in everything to my liking, you know, that kind of thing. For you to better understand it, just look that a child is born tabula rasa, meaning at the time of birth, 
all children are the same. The one who is in America and the one who is in Cholocho and the one who is in, I don't know which province, in Lusaka, all these children are the same. But what we parents put in there brings thieves, brings magicians, brings doctors, brings astronauts. Can you imagine? Some are busy bringing out thieves out of children. Yet children are born tabular. So the, 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 the issue I'm saying here is we need not to bring strange stuff from children. Let us bring chartered accountants. So uh, as I'm teaching you, I teach you tabular rasa. Meaning, if you are in this class, don't even say, say I was exempted. So I feel like that exemption is an academic license for me not to grasp these things. Because when I'm teaching you, I am taking that into account. You get that? OK. Just a, a, a light moment there, because I know that your concentration is too massive. So if it if it if it if it comes out to be two percent here, if if it comes out to be two percent, what it means is um, selling price or sales volume can can decrease by two percent. Notice this time it's decrease; it's not increase for NPV. To be negative. Oh, not to be negative per se. Let me say to be zero. Let me say. Are you not seeing that after you have told directors or you have explained to directors this way, you are now a manager? You don't just say NPV is positive, so let us do it. No. You now escalate it a little bit and say, well, in as much as it is negative, but be aware of this. If, this if these variables change to this extent, uh, we would rather change the cost of action. Now, uh, another, the, the issue here of, and of the, the main issues with sensitivity analysis, in, in as much as it's this pretty cool, you will notice that sensitivity analysis has got its own issues. The main issue is that it, it assumes that these variables change ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus meaning if one is changing, the others are assumed to be held constant. So if initial cost is changing, all other variables are not changing. So that's a, a limitation of sensitivity analysis. Another limitation is that it assumes that you as a director, you are in a position to identify all variables. You know, it's, it might not be possible, possible to identify variables. Was how? Would you be in a position to know that Russia will attack Ukraine? Suppose you are having a project in Ukraine. There are instances where you might not comprehend all the variables which will affect the project. So you may say, say, it appears I'm getting lost in the scheme of things. What is it that we are doing? We are saying main points to note when you are determining your project cash flows, and we have listed them. And we were now on point number F, where we say annual cash flows can be adjusted for risk and uncertainty using any of the following techniques. And we are continuing with the techniques. We have listed expected value approach, project specific cost, simulation, sensitivity analysis. The other approach you can use is called is called project is value at risk uh, let's say uh, before i come to project is value at risk let me say project duration which is number five project duration project duration now what is project duration uh, You know, it's, it's an approach to take into account risk and asset it in, in a particular project. So this measures weighted, weighted average period of time, average period of time 
is that the project is cash flows. Project is cash flows. Flows. The project is cash flows. Take to deliver value to the investor. The duration PD. The weighted period, uh, the weighted average period of time that uh, the project is cash flows take to deliver value to the investor. It is calculated as follows. PD is calculated as follows. Calculated as follows. You say project duration equals project duration equals so it's a matter of saying project duration equals uh, you say sum of sum of pv sum of let me say pv times t divided by sum of PV sum of PV times T divided by sum of PV this is how we calculate project duration so let me let me let me show you what what we mean here where let's steps involved steps involved in computing steps involved in computing project duration steps involved in computing project duration step one step one let's calculate Calculate the PVs of project is net cash flows. The PVs of project is net cash flows during the return phase. Return phase and find their sum and find their sum. This is what we are referring to as sum of PVs. This is what we are referring to as sum of PV. But I have, I have said a particular way today, I say the return phase. You know, a project has got two phases. When you're investing money like in year zero, we call it investment phase. When money is now coming out, coming in if in subsequent years, we call it the return phase because the project is now returning money to you. So there is two phases: investment phase when you are pumping out the money, and a return phase when you are getting the money. So we are ignoring year zero here because we are saying during the return phase. Is that okay with you guys? I ensure that you know that we are talking of a return phase. Step two. Uh, multiply multiply the PV of cash flow for each year for each year by the year to get to get to get some of the times t you multiply the pv of cash flows for each year by the year to get the sum of pv times t and then what you then have to do is step three okay. divide divide the result of Step two by that 
of step one. Step one to get project duration in years. Get project duration in years. So what you get with this formula, the answer must be in years. Let me have an illustration with you. Illustration. Just want, I just want you to see how project duration is calculated. Let's say here we have got year. Year, let's say one, one. Oh, remember, I said return phase. No wonder why I have ignored year zero. Net cash flow 800, 1500, 1860, 120. These are your net cash flows. And then let's say discounting factor is 10%, present value interest factor is 10%. You know? When you are finding present value interest rate, it's simply 1,1 to the power minus, you say equals 1,1 to the power is shift six minus y. Like that, that's how you get your discounting factors. Uh, make sure you know these Excel skills because your exam is computer based. Now, project duration goes like this. You need to have total here. Total. So you say PV. PV. Now, PV is a matter of finding PV of cash flows for each year. This multiplied by this. And if you add this, if you if you tally this up, you get PV. So you say equals sum. This is sum of PV. That's what we are referring to, a sum of PV. This is the sum of PV. And then our year is known as T. Our year is what we are referring to as T. So we then have to say PV times T like this, where we are saying equals this figure for PV here, multiplied by the year. That is step two where we say multiply the PV of cash flow for each year by the year. So this is PV times each year. And if you tally these up, you if you if you if you find their sum, you this is what is called sum of PV times T. That's what we are referring to as sum of PV times T. And then project duration. You then say project duration equals then, which is equals to, uh, you can now have project duration, which is equals to uh, open bracket. It's 10, 6, 7, 7, 10, 6, 7, 7, 0.41 divided by 4184, close bracket, which is equals to, so you can say equals this here divided by this 2.55 years make sure it's given in years that's project duration that's how you calculate it so you may say say remember you are you are teaching us this under incorporating risk and uncertainty so what is the management use of this variable you know, a project with shorter duration is preferable. The project with a shorter duration, the project with a shorter duration is preferable, preferable as it is a lower risk, a lower risk. You know, because it's a risk measure. So if you are getting, if, if, if the project is giving you value earlier, it's, 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 it's preferable. Remember by definition, 
it measures the weighted average period of time that the project is cash flows take to deliver value to the investor. So if you are having a project with a shorter duration, clearly it's, it's of low risk. Now you may say, say, we had a similar thing to this. We used to call it payback period. It, you know, this is different from payback period because it takes the overall cash flows. You know, payback period just took cash flows up to the year of payback. Meaning if payback is in year three, all cash flows after year three were ignored. But project duration considers cash flows over the overall uh, uh, duration of the project. So you can say the main advantage, the main advantage of project duration, project duration compared to payback period, payback period is that is that it takes into account time value of money and consider cash flows over the entire project is life. Project is life. You can see all cash flows are, are taken into account here. This is one way annual cash flows can take into account risk and uncertainty. So if you, I, I had opened a question here, you do notice this, this was a question paper I opened June 2019. Uh, you do notice amongst the questions, they, there was question, there was question what? Um, okay, is it was it June or December? Let me see. Uh, this wasn't June. I just want to find a question here. This is December 2019. December 2019, you can see there was this question here which is saying, Estimate project is how fast duration based on its best case present values. Two marks. Though it's two marks, but it was going to form part of part C, where, where you are now asked to comment. So if you are to read the, we are not going to answer the whole question though, but if you, if you read this part, If you read this part here, up to here, if if you, if you are to read together, you notice that actually from here, they are saying previously, Okan company has used the risk ad, risk adjusted discount rates to calculate net present value of the project. You now know these terms now. However, the finance director believes that calculating adjusted present values. So that is what we call APV. We have listed it amongst our topics. The finance director believes that calculating adjusted present values would be more appropriate. Okan wants to base its decision on which project to invest in, on the returns generated by the project and the project is a risk as measured by their project duration and important non-financial aspects. So there is project durations. 
it measures project risk. So you need to understand this. So you can see here in the foregoing discussion that the project duration for the other project was already calculated. Let me see. They are saying project beta duration is 2,43 years based on its best case present value. So the other project's duration was calculated and you were required to calculate the other one. And then comment as you evaluate which project to choose based on factors which all can consider important, meaning the factors I have just read there. Why am I opening this question? Just for you to, re to familiarize yourself, to know that what we are saying here is not like you should not consider it like, oh, this is just an introductory lesson. No, it's no longer an introductory lesson. Remember, we are on chapter eight on the platform. So we are already hitting the, the mark. We are, we, I, I listed the topic at the beginning, so you already know that the syllabus is well within reach. But as I'm teaching you this particular platform, as I said, I compress the platform into seven topics. So I will be teaching, I'll be letting you know what part of the platform does this particular discussion covers. This one we are doing covers chapter session eight and also other stuff. Another way of incorporating risk and uncertainty is project is value at risk. Project is value at risk. So it var value at risk. We call it var like this. Project is value at risk, which is number, it's number what? Because we are taking into account the risk and uncertainty. Duration was duration was number five. So project is value at risk. It's number six. What is project is value at risk? Like this, this approach measures the maximum, the maximum expected loss from a project from a project at a given level of confidence 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 some may call it at a given level of probability at a given level of confidence for example, for example, a VAR of $2 million at 90% confidence, a VAR of $2 million at 90% confidence implies that management is 90% sure that losses from the project, losses from the project will not exceed. Yeah. That's, that's what value at risk means, measures. It measures the maximum expected loss from a project at a given level of confidence. So if you have got a VAR of 2 million, 80-90% confidence. What it simply means is, as management, we are 90% sure that losses from this particular project will not exceed 2 million. Simple as that. So how do we calculate VAR? VAR is calculated as follows. Calculated as follows. VAR is calculated as follows. We simply say value at risk equals. So this is how we calculate value at risk. You say S by by, let's say SD multiply by K 
multiplied by the square root of n sd multiplied by k multiplied by the square root of n where sd is the standard deviation of pro of project sketch flows standard deviation of the project sketch flows Project is cash flows. Always know you need to know that from your studies elsewhere, standard deviation, if it's not given, you find it by saying square root of variance. If you are given variance, you find the square root of variance to get the standard deviation. If you have done mathematics, you might be familiar with this. If you haven't get it from your say now, you might not be given cash flows as a standard deviation, but you may be given them as variance. Always know that standard deviation is the square root of variance. And then N is project is life. Project is life. And K K is the normal K is the normal distribution distribution table value table value at the given level of confidence at the given level of confidence confidence so what i want to do perhaps is to give you the the question paper so that we use the distribution tables together uh, okay uh, okay i'm attaching the question paper here It's, it's just for the sake of using the tables. For the sake of using the tables there. All right. Mm -hmm. So there you go, you can open it. You can open it. Please, I'm giving you two minutes to open it. Okay. All right. I have opened it. It is pretty cool. Uh, now, um, if 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 you scroll down, where is it? If you scroll down uh, this question paper at the end, you are used to two main tables, which is present value tables and annuity tables. But what we are noticing now is we do have another table which is the another table which is the normal distribution table values this is the present value table you are used to this annuity table you are equally used to this but this is the standard normal distribution table this is the table i'm referring to here as i'm saying is the normal distribution table value at the given level of confidence so let me say, let, let us now have a, 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 an illustration of finding K from the tables. Finding K from the tables. Right, from the table. Now, because if you don't know how to find K, you won't be in a position to calculate value at risk. Uh, so let me have as a, as a to say confidence level 
confidence level and then k i want to put as many confidence levels as possible so oh, this is confidence level and then k let me put confidence level of 90 percent another of 95 percent another of 98 percent another of 97 percent well so what we are going to do is i am demonstrating how to find k in the tables i'm going to do the first two so when we are doing the first two make sure you pay attention confidence level and this is k from tables from normal standard normal tables standard normal tables so you are paying you are paying a, a particular attention to this so when when you are using this table and k is a uh, confident level is 90 percent this table you can see all probabilities in this table the the highest figure we have is 4.9999999 so this table is configured in such a manner that you don't exceed 0.5 so it's it's just a one tail of the normal distribution table it 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 it, 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 it you don't exceed 1.5 when i say inside the table which I shall say shortly. When I'm saying inside the table, I'm referring to these figures here. I'm, I'm, I, I, am, I am excluding these figures at the top. These are not referred to as inside the table. These ones are not inside the table, my wonderful team. These figures are not inside, they are outside. Also, these figures on your extreme left are outside. So which figures are inside? These ones, zero comma, blah, 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 but from this figure here down to this figure here, these are figures which are inside the table. These ones, two comma, three comma, which are on the extreme left are outside the table. So if you want to find K when we have 90% probability, what you do is please pay attention. You say, you say 0, 0,5. Why 0, 0,5? Because the table should not exceed 0, 0,5. You say 0, 0,5 minus, actually, actually, let me say you have 90%. You say 1 minus 0, 0,9 what you get is 0, 0,1 notice this 0, my 0, 0,9 is the 90 percent confidence so what i get is 0, 0,1 if i take it from one and then i say 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,1 what i get is 0, 0,4 if i say 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,1 what I get is 0, 0,4, right? Why 0, 0,5? 0, 0,5 is just a figure from the table because the table cannot exceed 0, 0,5. It's not like, say, where are you getting 0, 0,5? I've explained. And then from the table, from inside the table, oh, comma the number close to the number close to 0 comma 4 is is close to 0 comma 4 from inside the table i come to this part here which i'm referring to as inside the number which is close to 0 comma 4 if you want me to look at it closely is this number here. The number which is close to 0, 0,4 is 0, 0,3997. 
Are you not seeing that? That's the number which is very, very close to 0 0,4. Is, is 0 0,3997, which corresponds to the K value of. Now we, not, we need to find K. Now, if you want to find the K on 0, 0,3997, it's a matter of locating its coordinates. What are the coordinates of this number here from the table? What are the coordinates of this number? You say on the left, it's 1,2. And on the right, I mean, on top, it's under 8. On the left, it's 1,2 on top it's under 0, 0,08 so it becomes 1,28 so the k value is 1,28 this is the k value that you then put in the formula for calculating value at risk now you may say say does it mean in the exam i will be doing all these steps no i am doing all these steps because i am the teacher i want to explain things to you in the exam, you already know this. So it's a matter of not even writing anything. It's a matter of just going to your table and pick 1,28 as your K. So by doing it, I am explaining it to you. Now I'm doing the last. So make sure you pay attention because you do 98% and 97% on your own. What is the... K value at 95% confidence. It's easy. Say one minus, in the exam, you will not be doing this. It, you do it on your calculator. One minus 0, 0,95. What, I'm, what I get is 0, 0,05. That's what I get. Then I say then 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,05. What do I get? I get 0, 0,45 equals 0, 0,45. Now, with this, I then say from inside the table, the table, comma, the number close, close to 0, 0,45 is what is the number close to 0, 0,45? Remember, I'm picking this number from inside the table. By inside, I mean this. So I want 0, 0,45. It's easy. This, these are the two numbers close. So I just take whatever I want. Normally, we, we, we encourage you to take the one which is on your left. These two numbers are in equal measure close to 0, 0,45. One is 0, 0,4495 and 505. So you take this one, 0, 0,4495. Because well, remember, this is about estimation. So it's 0, 0,4495, which corresponds to a k value of what is the K value? It's a matter of locating the coordinates of this. It's 1,6 to the left, under what? Under 4, 1,64. So there you go. If you had taken this, you would get 1,65. It is still fine, we mark both, because it's mere estimation. 1,64. 1,64. Can you do the rest? I'm giving you, I'm giving you, I mean, three minutes to complete the rest. Can you do that? I'm giving you three minutes, just three. Do that, do that guys, waiting. Once you are done, type it in the chat. Type in the chat how you are how you are coming up with the figures. Type the figures in the chat.
right? Type the figures in the chat. Right, I'm sure we are, we are about to wrap it up. I'm expecting you to type in the chat the answers that you, you guys are getting. All right, let me see what if anyone is typed anything. Uh, you need to tell me the percentage type, the confidence and the K. The confidence level and the K. Put it to two decimal places. Put your K to two decimal places. No, Chamalanga, the 90, 95% I've done it already. It's 1,64. I needed 98 and 97. That's what I'm asking. I suppose you wanted to type 98.
Okay. So 98, you got it as 2,5. And then 97, you get it, you got it as 1,88. A quick look, it's, it, it's, it doesn't even take me time to look at it. Oh, Lindy, where is typing? Can you rip up typing, Lindy, where so that I can even look at that? Ninety-eight, two comma zero five, and ninety-seven, one comma eight eight. So, Chambalanga, did you want it to type two comma five or two comma zero five? Or oh, Lindy, where did you want it to type two comma zero five or two comma five? I, I just, I just. <laughs> okay. Oh, so Chambalanga is saying I want he wanted to type two comma zero five instead of two comma five. So by consensus, uh, it's, okay, so it's easy to get to that. You know, in an exam, this is how you go about it. We are talking of 95%, or you do 98. You say 1 minus 0, 0,98, you get 0, 0,02. And you say 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,02, you get 0, 0,0. Uh, 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,02, you get 0, 0, 0, 0,48. So you find a number which is close to 0, 0,48 from the tables. The number which is close to 0, 0,48 from the tables is this one. So I take it to mean it gives us a K value of 2,0 under 5. So at 98% is 2,05, you are correct. Then 97%, so that's how we do it in an exam. There's no need for you to write all these, all these steps. 97% is like 1 minus 0, 0,97 is 0, 0,03. 0, 0,5 minus 0, 0,03 is 0, 0,4. It's 0, 0,4 what? 7. 0, 0,47. Then you have to fish out a number which is close to 0, 0,47, you get it as 0, 0,4699, which corresponds to a table value of 1,8 under 8. So you can see that knowing K is very, very important because it helps you to calculate value at risk, 2,05. And, oh, sorry, this is 2,05 and 1,88, yes. So you, you now know this. Then let us now do a wrap up, a wrap this today's session by discussing investment appraisal techniques. Investment appraisal techniques. Investment appraisal techniques. You know, when you are invest, when you are appraising a project, there are quite a lot of investment appraisal techniques, like accounting rate of return, payback period, discounted payback. Those ones we are not going to discuss them at your level. Sure, you can't say I'm doing advanced financial management only for someone to peep through and realize that you are calculating payback period. Surely that one, that one, that won't work out right. So we are we are going to start from net present value, coming uh, followed by internal rate of return. Now rate of return, followed by modified internal rate of return, modified IR. Uh, this is number three. and then followed by profitability index. Profitability 
index PI. We, we normally discuss PI in a capital rationing situation. Capital rationing situation. In other words, when we are utilizing, when we are trying to find the best way of utilizing available finance, when finance is in short supply and you want to undertake various projects with positive NPV. We all know what NPV is, so we, we need not to take time on this. You know what NPV is. It's basically the most important investment appraisal technique. The most important, important investment appraisal approach. Why is this most important? We are saying each decision takes precedence over all others. Each decision takes precedence over others. That's what we mean. If NPV says reject, any other, any other approach, if it says accept, it doesn't matter. So accept project if positive, accept project NPV is positive, otherwise reject. You know all that. How do we calculate NPV? It's simply a matter of saying NPV equals sum of sum of PVs of net cash net cash flows minus initial outlay initial outlay how you calculate NPV sum of PVs of net cash inflows minus initial outlay but your exam is computer based so I shall show you shortly how you calculate it because with a computer based exam we do it slightly different from a paper based exam two IRR so IRR stands for internal rate of return you know you know what it is NPV I mean cost of capital which gives NPV of zero cost of capital which gives NPV of zero you know we accept project if IRR exceeds capital capital you know IRR gets its meaning from its term so let's say IRR let's say IRR is 13 percent for example and cost of capital cost of capital let's say cost of capital is uh, 10 percent you know cost of capital means those who funded the project they need 10 cents per dollar IRR means internally the project is generating 13 cents per dollar so if IRR exceeds cost of capital, it means what we are getting internally is more than what we are paying to the capital providers. So no wonder why we are saying accept if IRR exceeds cost of capital. Remember, we used it to calculate IRR using linear interpolation, where you where you would calculate two NPVs and stuff. This time we are no longer going to do that. It's easy. I shall show you shortly. Then let us now have limitations of IRR. Limitations of IRR. In as much as IRR is a good investment approach, it has got two limitations. Two main limitations. One, it's not suitable for a project 
non-conventional cash flows. Non-conventional cash flows. What are these projects? Uh, the projects which we say they have got non-conventional cash flows. It means this is a project. This is a project. Inflows at the beginning and another uh, sorry with cash outflow outflow at the beginning and another outflow during the project is life during the project is life such a project will report will put multiple IRRs. You know, concerning cash flow patterns, concerning cash flow patterns, you know, a project, you know, the project we are used to are projects where you have cash inflow at the beginning. I mean, outflow at the beginning. And then as we go, we do have inflows 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 so there's outflow and then inflows 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 but if a project has got outflow at the beginning and then another outflow during the project's life such cash flow pattern is known as non-conventional cash flows it's called a non-conventional cash flow pattern because you've got outflow at the beginning say inflow in year one inflow in year two and in year three another outflow if you have got if you have got such projects and you are asked to calculate IRR, you get multiple IRRs. And such multiple IRRs will then have will be of limited use. So that's weakness number one, non-conventionality of cash flows. Limitation of, of IRR number two, it's Reinvestment assumption. Reinvestment assumption. What do we mean by the reinvestment assumption? We are saying IRR assumes that assumes that project cash flows are reinvested it IRR. In practice, practice comma, companies do reinvest at required rate of return. I want to explain this part. When I was explaining this part, uh, I, I, I said IRR gets its meaning from its name. It, you know, when you are getting money for, for year one, you don't lock that money in the safe, no. If a project is good five years and it's giving you money on a yearly basis, it means each year, the money you get, you have to reinvest that money. And the return you get following reinvestment of the money, that's what we said it's called internal rate of return, when you are reinvesting the money internally. But that assumption is flawed. It is flawed in the sense that IRR assumes that as you are getting the money, you are reinvesting that money at IRR. Yet, in practice, companies, they don't reinvest the money at IRR. Rather, they reinvest the money at required rate of return, not in IRR. So IRR then has got theoretical but not practical meaning. It is only theoretical but not practical meaning. So how do you, how do you get around this? You calculate what is called modified IRR. 
modified IRR. Some put it as MIRR. Modified IRR. It is put simply as MIRR. So you need to understand what MIRR is. This is our last discussion item. I just give you an example and then we wrap it up for today. So MIRR right, is uh, it's like this. This is meant to mitigate the reinvestment, the reinvestment assumption associated with IRR. You know, if we say reinvestment, IRR is, has got a weakness on its reinvestment assumption. It means we rectify it by calculating modified IRR. So MIRR, MIRR is the IRR which would result if it is not assumed, assumed that project cash flows, project cash flows are reinvested at IRR. This is modified IRR. It is IRR which we get if we assume that we don't reinvest project cash flows at, at, at IRR. It's a better measure. It's a better measure compared to IRR. It's actually a better measure compared to IRR. So when you want to calculate modified IRR, nowadays your exam is computer based. I want to show you how you do it. Uh, let me check if I still have people. Oh, you guys who are still there, please hang in there. Yang in there, don't find any reason to exit because what I'm going to say now is important. Uh, let me find a question from the question bank. Question bank is our source document for questions. Everything we need, you get it from the question bank. Mm -hmm. Right, let me see. You know, I'm here in the city center, I'm in Arara, and it's raining like nobody's business. It's raining like, like there's no tomorrow. Okay, let me go to question number 44. Revere company. It's on page 86. Revere company is on page 86. Isn't there a better way of getting to the page? This paper. Page number eight six. You can see there is Chinese, there is this question bank, if depending on the language you are using, we do teach others who are learning it in Chinese. So no wonder why if you open it like this, you see Chinese there, and then it then puts it then puts English there. It's in multiple languages. All you have to do is to select language at the beginning. 
or when the admin registers you, they put language for you. Well, it appears. Oh, well, let me say Olivier. Olivier. Let me check if I can get Olivier come down there. Because it appears by. I know what is causing this. It's my it's my network. Because it's a it's a view only document. Or well, actually we found that that question is in December 2014 from this. So let us check if we have December 2014 question. December 2014. Let me see if, if I can make it here. Allow me to close this. And let me, let me not rush in, in searching for the person. Because if I'm rushing, it appears I will not get there. If here it's question number eight or six. Question number eight or six. Right. And then can I not come to the page? Page number three four three. Question number eight or six, page number three four three. So it appears these are these are now answers. So it's actually page number eight and six. Page number eight and six. Yeah. I'm getting there. This is page number 76. Allow me to get to page number 86 from the question bank. You know, it's in digital format. So if your internet is not that fast, it, you get yourself screwed like oh, I'm, I'm, I'm. Okay. 83, I'm getting there. I want to get page number 86. So this is this is page number what? Mm -hmm. This is page number 86. It's now we are already on page number eight or seven without getting to the question. Okay. If if I'm having difficulties viewing it because of my network here. What I can do is to Google it up right away from the ACCA exam library. December, December, December.
2014 P4 question paper. Like this. December 2014 P4 question paper. You can still get it from this. Uh, all question papers are here. The, the issue is my 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 machine here is streaming, uploading it live here and trying to share the screen at the same time. Or oh, it has opened. So finally, it has opened. Okay. So let me use the question bank. So it's saying Revere Company is a small company based in the European Union. It produces high quality frozen foods, which it, which it exports to a small number of supermarket chains located within EU as well. The EU is a free trade area for trade between member countries. Revere Company finds it difficult to obtain bank finance and relies on a long-term strategy of using internally generated funds for new investment projects. This constraint means that it cannot accept every project and, is often, or, and often it has to choose between them. Revere Company is considering investing in one of the two mutually exclusive projects, which is Project Privy and Project Druggy or Draggy. Preview will, uh, so let me zoom it to 150. Okay. So they're saying here, uh, Preview will produce and sell a new range of frozen desserts exclusively within the EU. And the drug you produce and sell a new range of frozen desserts and savory food to supermarket chains based in countries outside the EU. Each project will last for five years, and the following financial information refers to both projects. So this this is the project. So project drug is after tax cash flows are expected expected are like this. So you've got cash flows for Project Draghi, and then you are given net present value for Privy. You are given internal rate of return for Privy. You are given modified internal rate of return for Privy. So you are given IRR for Privy. You are given modified IRR for Privy, but you are not given for Draghi. You are also given value at risk for Privy at 95%, value at risk for Draghi at 90%, I mean for Privy, but for Draghi everything has to be calculated. Now we are also given that both projects is net present value have been calculated based on a reverse nominal cost of capital of 10%. It can be assumed that both projects' cash flows returns are normally distributed, and the annual standard deviation of project is drugs present value of after tax cash flows is 400,000 euros. So you are given standard deviation. All this is you are given for you to calculate value at risk for these cash flows which are missing. Now, the question is. Discuss the aims of a free trade area such as the EU and possible benefits of Revere of operating within the EU. So this is the topics which you have been studying this past week about international trade. You know, it's, it should be session four. Like impact of doing business international. So, you, you know, in the, on international circles, there is what is called trading blocks like free trade area, like Euro European Union is the EU. And in, in Africa here, we have got SADAC. What are, the, what, what are the purposes of entering into these trading blocks? This you must have covered last week. You do notice if you are a part of a trading block, we are, like you are a part of European Union, there is free movement of labor and capital. When you are in EU, because it's an economic area, 
we get it's an economic union actually you can move from portugal and working in germany without a passport all you have to do is to prove that you are an eu citizen so it's a benefit and also there's a free movement of of, of capital within the eu there are no tariffs amongst member states so there's free movement of capital so if Livia company is within the eu it benefits from labor skills as well as capital the main aims why companies enter into these trading blocks is what we call trade creation you may ask why is it eu has got 27 member countries why do they benefit the aim is trade creation trade creation means nations within the eu they specialize and create trade with each other like france is into wine and tourism you know france is france specializes in leisure and wine how i would love to be in paris how i would love leisure and just relaxing somewhere else germany specializes in high tech and technology and robotics so if you want these you have to go to germany first before you can go to to any other country london uk is no longer in the eu though but it used to specialize in finance and we do have other countries like Italy, sporty cars, spaghetti, and fashion, whatever you call it. So these are the purposes of any place. It's specialized, it, it, it is meant to create trade as the countries within the block specialize and create trade with each other. Another is trade diversion. Trade diversion means Trade is diverted away from non-block members to block members. So if we say Ireland specializes in milk, before you can they can import milk from Africa, they have to get it from Ireland first. So trade is diverted away from non-block members to block members. This is the aim. So what are the two aims? Trade creation and trade diversion. And what are the benefits that Rivia company is likely to get if it operates within the EU? There's a free movement of labor, so it gets a lot of skills, and there's free movement of capital and technology, so it equally benefits. Another is there is an enlarged market. Because Rivia is within the EU, so its products will be given priority within the EU, so it has got access to an enlarged market. Now, the question I really wanted was question B, which is saying calculate figures which have not been provided for project drug and recommend which project should be accepted. Now, this is what I want. So let me, it is going to take me just five minutes and then we are done for today. Remember, I said we should end it 2045. Project drug. You know, I skim my things to the letter, I skim my lectures to the letter. I know that by such a time will be done. Project drug, so we can say pro year. Yeah. Yeah. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. There are five years given there. And then there's net cash flows already calculated for us. So net cash flows that we are we are given are um, for project drug eleven eight fourteen year one twelve thirty in year two minus eleven eight forty twelve thirty and then. 1680, 1450, 1680, 450, and last two are 10, 240, and 2.2. 10, 240, and 2200. Now, if you want to calculate IRR, once you have got net cash flows, notice. Now that your exam is computer based, there's no need for you to go to tables. 
if you want to calculate NPV, you simply say NPV, NPV at 10%. You first get net cash flows. Then you say NPV at 10% equals. Notice how you go about it. You come to a fresh box and say equals NPV. Open bracket. You put the rate as 10%. And then a comma, not a full stop, but a comma. And then you highlight values from year one to the end. After put, you highlight values from year one to the end, close bracket. And then you know that you need to subtract initial outlay. But remember, initial outlay is negative. So if you say minus a minus, it's then added. So to subtract a negative number, you add it like this, plus year zero. That's how you calculate NPV. You get that? Which is 22,295. It's already given in the exam. 22,293, uh, because these are estimates, but that's the answer. Now, Tell me how I said you calculate NPV. Semba, if you are still there. Tell me how, how, how I said you calculate it on your Excel. Who else is still there? Princess, are you there? Patience. How, I said you calculate NPV like what? How do you go about it? Let me see your comment. Uh, oh, drag. Oh, okay. Let me repeat uh, Chamberlang. Because it's not exactly how I said you do it. I said you do it like this. You say equals NPV. Because you your exam is now computer based. We don't expect you to go to the tables. After getting net cash flows, just to say equals NPV, open bracket, put 10%, put a comma. You highlight figures from year one through to the end. Close the bracket. Don't say minus initial outlay because it's negative here. So for you to subtract a negative number, you add it plus year zero like this. Let me see. Oh, well, I'm, I'm about, I, I understand. Don't worry, just hang in for three minutes because the, you replay the lecture anyway. I understand that. I understand that. Now, how do you calculate IRR? When you are calculating IRR, it's the other missing figure. You say IRR equals. Notice. You simply say equals IRR, open brackets, and you highlight every number from the beginning to the end. 16%, that's your IRR. Now, Lindy, wait, tell me how I said you calculate IRR. Hmm? Pesci. Uh, this one is easy, Tim. Do I still only have Champalanga here? Yes, Lindy. Oh, uh, Lindy, we're from, from the beginning, I'm sure you're having issues with your audio. So let me repeat. When you are calculating IRR at your level, please don't use tables. Otherwise, you will not finish the exam. All you have to do is to get net cash flows. After getting net cash flows, you simply say equals IRR. Open bracket. Highlight everything from the beginning to the end. Close bracket. Enter. That's your IRR. 
So this is what the examiner required when they say calculate missing figures here. It's so easy. Don't think you will, you were required to go over again everything like what we used to do before when we were doing paper based exam. This is no longer a paper based exam. It's a computer based exam. Now, how about modified IRR? You say M. M I R R equals. So what you then do is you say equals M I R R. Pay attention, team. IRR, you open the bracket. You highlight the values first. From the first to the end. And then you put a comma. You don't put close the brackets. You put a comma. And you put cost of capital 10%. Make sure I'm putting the percentage side. And I put cost of capital again 10% the percentage side. And then I close the bracket. I hit enter. So my MIRR is 14%. That's how you calculate modified IRR. Let me repeat. When you are calculating modified IRR, you say equals MIRR. You open bracket. You highlight values from the first to the end. You don't close the bracket. You put a comma. And then you, you put costs of capital, which is the finance rate, 10%. The finance rate is equally the same as the reinvestment rate. You put a comma and so, so you put 10% close bracket. Like this. So there you go. You have your MIRR. So to the extent of this, we have covered today's discussions. This is where the... The missing figures, now there are still missing figures for project drug like value at risk. This one you can now know, calculate it easily because you now know how to calculate K from tables. So we have done the donkey work on this. It's no longer an issue. And then other comments are from theoretical stuff that I said do in the first week. So, this is the question bank that I'm opening from the platform. You can see that our platform has got integrity. It has got everything we need, everything. You don't say I'm studying on the platform. I, I can't find information on the platform. You can't do that. So notice I am studying and revising with you at the same time. This is the Revere company, Revere company, question number 44 that we have done. We have already put debriefing video on it. So you can, if you are starting on the platform, please attempt it and then come to debriefing video. But remember, we have already debriefed it, like how I'm saying it. So this is the same debriefing video. So what we have covered here is like session eight and other sessions. So what like techniques for dealing with the risk session 11, we have already done this in, in today's lecture. When they say techniques for dealing with the risk, like project duration, probability, risk adjusted discount rates, expected value, sensitivity analysis. We have already done that value at risk, Monte Carlo simulation. So if you are asked, what is it that is your to-do list this week? It's session number eight and session number 11. This is already covered. So you now have the notes. You go to the study material section and, 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 and read the notes on session number eight and session number 11. That's what we have covered today. Even session number 10, sorry, session number 10, we have covered it again. Session number 10, like capital rationing, this one we are yet to cover it. So I'm going to send you my video on session number 10 like single period capital rationing and multi period capital rationing so next week by the time we meet next week everyone is done 8 10 and 11. by the time you are going to meet next week everyone is done session number eight session number 10 and session number 11. 
But not on session number 10, which is on capital rationing, we have not done it in this lecture. So I'm going to send you my video link. I taught it already. I'm going to send you my video link in our WhatsApp class group. You will find it. On that note, enjoy. I will re-emphasize this message on WhatsApp tomorrow morning. Cheers, guys. Bye.